So the Australian gold industry, it's the third largest export industry in Australia, produces 8 million ounces of gold annually, second behind China. 56% of this is sourced from underground production, with the remaining 44% come from open pit production. There's 50 mines that operate across the country. 78% is sourced from gold-only mines, with the remaining 22% coming from gold produced as a co- or a byproduct. The highest grade mine, sorry, the average mine is just under 3.3 grams per tonne, and the highest grade mine is Andy Well in WA with 10.2. And the lowest grade is Cadia in New South Wales uh, at half a gram. And those two examples we'll look at in a little bit more detail later on. Australia's ranked first by audited resource inventory. Now the advantages that gold has over other commodities such as iron ore and coal, these bulk commodities, um, you don't need expensive transport uh, infrastructure to get the product from the site uh, to the purchaser. Gold is produced on site and can be driven and often flown out uh, to the refinery and the mint. You don't need offtake agreements, contracts, and there's always a buy for the gold. So essentially, mining it, milling it, pouring it, storing it, and selling it. So why are there so many gold deposits in Australia? Each of those yellow pins represents a deposit, not necessarily a mine. The answer is in the underlying geology, which I won't bore you with the details of. But the point to take home from here is that Australia's had a very long geological history. If we look at the time scale at the bottom there on this slide of the global distribution of gold through time, We've got a mere three billion years of time as Earth's history. And during that time, there's been four peaks of gold formation. The important thing to look at there with Australia is that it contains three of those four peaks of gold uh, formation, the Archean, Proterozoic, and the Paleozoic. This is where the Jork compliant resources are located. The yellow dots represent the larger ones of the uh, plus 30 million tonnes contained gold. And location of some of the really big ones of uh, Bonington, the super pit in Kalgoorlie, and again, Cadia in New South Wales. Uh, upwards of 20 million ounces. So this slide is uh, one of these information slides. The licensing varies across Australia depending on what state you're in. So this, this licensing really deserves a talk all in itself. Um, so, but what I'll draw your attention to is the Graticular Exploration Licenses. Um, and uh, the maximum area you can have here is uh, 70 blocks in a mineralised area, 20 blocks in an outside mineralised area. There's no limit to how many you can have. As long as you pay for them, you can have as many as you like. The main difference came in February 2006, and this related to mining licenses. So before this time, you could peg a mining license and you didn't really have to have a contained mineral deposit on it. You could just peg it over the top of an exploration license. So with exploration licenses, you start with a large area, you start exploring to the area that you want to focus on, and then you drop off the areas that you don't want. Now, the idea of dropping that off is that it frees up the ground, other people can come in, and it's done on anniversary periods. However, what was happening, companies that had the money would peg mining leases over the tops of the areas that they would drop in so they could keep the ground. So it became a way of retaining the ground but had a negative effect on exploration. Other people couldn't come in to explore it and nine times out of ten, the people that had the mining leases over the top wouldn't be exploring it anyway. So after February 06, you actually had to have an identified ore body to apply for a mining licence and you also had to have outlined the area of the infrastructure and the mining methods that you'd be using. So essentially it's a jaw compliant resource and you had to have a qualified person to sign off on that before you'd even get that lease.